Hi, Susan. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Susan Schneider, and uh, you have a number of affiliations. Uh, you are a philosophy professor at the University of Connecticut. You are uh, currently a fellow at the Center for Theological Inquiry uh, at, in Princeton, actually, where you're yep. involved in some kind of NASA project involving all kinds of strange science fiction-y things. And you, you're also connected to the uh, Center for Bioethics at Yale University. Yes. You wrote a book called The Language of Thought, A New Philosophical Direction. And uh, you co-edited a book uh, called what, Philosophy and Science Fiction? Or you, you edited that, you, you edited that solely, actually. So yeah. It, it, and science Fiction very, and Philosophy is the name of it. That's a very accessible, popular book. Yeah. And, and so you're very enviable. It sounds like you found a way to make a living just kind of thinking cosmic thoughts, thinking like about uh, whether computers could be conscious, whether we could like offload the contents of our brains to silicon chips and thereby have everlasting life, whether if we get visited by aliens, it will be aliens per se or actually an artificial intelligence that the aliens created and then subsequently dominated them. I and questions all these kinds of questions you're you're comfortable with, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Um, the alien stuff um, just kind of came late in the game. Um, it was about a year ago that there was this NASA conference, and somebody invited me to speak at the Library of Congress on uh, what aliens would be like if they existed. And interacting with the people at NASA and um, other astrobiologists was just so fun. I couldn't resist. Well, let, let's start there. What would aliens be like? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, it's highly speculative. Um, but my point was just, you know, the smartest ones may very well be artificial intelligences. They would be synthetic. Um, that's not to say they'll be made of silicon and they'll have processors that look anything like ours, but that they'll be highly enhanced artificial beings. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that there won't be biological life. Some people have interpreted me as making that suggestion or that there will be more super intelligent aliens in the world than biological life or in the universe, that is. Mm -hmm. But I do suspect that the smartest creatures will be artificial. So the idea is that if they were smart enough to contact us in the first place, they would probably be well ahead of us in terms of technological evolution, which means they would have either kind of kind of kind of turned the whole thing over to AI or enhanced their own like native equipment so much that it that that it's you know we you wouldn't necessarily recognize it as biological per se yeah I mean they may not even be interested in contacting us I'm not making any claims about that because if they're truly super intelligent um, they may be completely uninterested in us it could be like us being interested in a goldfish or something like that. Yeah, but, but we study goldfish. Yeah. We have, there are goldfish authorities. There's probably a Department of Earth Studies on, you know, someplace near Alpha Centauri for all we know. So the big question is whether life is truly abundant. So people talk about uh, all these exoplanets as if they're truly inhabited just because they're habitable. But it's not at all clear that um, life is everywhere. Uh, that's actually an empirical question that's extremely difficult and we don't have any clue. Mm -hmm. So all I'm claiming is that um, if there really is life elsewhere, it's highly likely that it's older than Earth. Earth is a galactic baby and it may very well be ultra intelligent and enhanced and in that case we may not even be interesting to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, actually, uh, I actually have a slightly different theory as to why we haven't been contacted, as far as we know, uh, by alien life, which is that when you get to the point roughly where we are in a planet, in technological history, you basically blow the planet up. Unless, unless you do an extraordinary job of adjusting to the challenges uh, that are posed at this point in history. Yeah, I'm very worried about precisely that issue. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of reasons to believe that we might in fact be at a crossroads. I mean, I've been worried about the development of super intelligent AI on Earth. So, you know, as AI progresses, it might not be too long, decades maybe, before we get to artificial general intelligence. 
And then at that point, um, you know, it could be that super intelligence fo follows rather quickly because the AGIs can improve themselves rather rapidly. And they may have no interest in us and they may have goals that work against human interest. So we may not be on this planet very long, although there would still be something to contact other okay, creatures. So in this scenario, the whole thing doesn't get blown up. It's just that yeah. the advanced form of AI that you refer to as super intelligence kind of takes over mm -hmm. and either like puts us in gooey pods like in the Matrix if they want to at least let us enjoy the indulgence of <laughs> dreams. That way, right now, you what? never know. You never know. But it, but one way or another, that's your scenario. I'm more worried about blowing the whole thing up. But in any event, let's let's uh, let's go with that. So uh, I mean, I would think then they still would have contacted us. You, Why you would they contact us? I mean, first of all, um, wouldn't it be rather shocking to us if we were contacted by robots that supplanted biological life? I mean. And second of all, why would they be interested in something as well, basic well, as us? It's funny. I mean, you're kind of asking why would they share the kind of curiosity that humans have? And yet the assumption in the scenario where they take over is that they would share the human kind of drive for power and conquest, right? They'd like want to take us over. And that's actually the part of the scenario I don't totally understand. Mm -hmm. Like, like, you know, it seems like the deal with software is even AI we program it to do what we want and it's not that easy for me to envision the point when it starts doing things we don't want i hope you're right um <laughs> there's been a lot of debate about that recently in computer science and philosophy and in the media based on a book by um, nick bostrom mm -hmm. called Super intelligence and it led people like bill gates and stephen hawking and elon musk to make very public grim pronouncements about the possibility of being able to control super intelligent AI if it's developed. So, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, now, would creatures from other planets contact us? I mean, you have to distinguish two scenarios. I mean, if something is created on Earth, um, you know, an alternative form of intelligence, it may not intend to hurt us, but its goals may be different. It may inadvertently hurt us because we're sharing the same planet. But if there is, on the other hand, a species that's supplanted by AI near Alpha Centauri, it may have absolutely no interest in us at all. And also, space travel could be harder than we think. There are vast galactic distances to travel. There are a lot of reasons. I mm -hmm. mean, this is really um, a question asked by people who think about the Fermi paradox, the question, where are they, right? Mm -hmm. where, where is everybody if, well, we can put it now as there are all these uh, exoplanets that are said to be inhabitable. Why aren't they inhabited? Right. Yeah. But, yeah, it could be life is just a rare okay. thing. Now, um, so... But there are a lot of pessimists out there. On I, I mean, there is a you know Elon Musk, these various people afraid. Uh, I think Stephen Hawking uh, afraid that AI would be uh, malevolent. I mean, the good news in my scenario, you know, where uh, where the big peril when you get to our point of uh, of technological development is blowing the whole thing up, is that maybe that means that any species that survives that is like morally very advanced and they've kind of overcome. Uh, some of the more, uh, some of the blinder forms of... Yeah, that's a great point. Um, let's hope, right? Unless it's AI that's supplanted uh, biological life because it's simply vastly more powerful. Yeah. So can you tell me something um, about this singularity business? Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, just in terms of dividing, you know, looking at the landscape of optimism and pessimism about the future. Yeah. I take it that the sing singularity enthusiasts, like Ray Kurzweil, they are uniformly optimists, right? The, is the idea of the singularity always that it's like going to be a good thing? No. It's not? Okay, first of all, maybe we should define singularity, and you're probably better at that than, than I am. What, what? Well, I think a lot of people say that it's the point at which technology gets vastly so good that we can no longer follow it because it's facilitated by AI. So technological developments increase at an increasing rate and right. no no humans can even follow those developments because AI is fueling it and AI has something like recursive self-improving algorithms so the AI can improve itself. And it could be a really good thing. I mean, um, 
Kurzweil sketches a technological utopia in his books. And when I first learned of the singularity, I was very excited by his books. But I now think that um, <laughs> there are a lot of alternative positions. Um, and it's really just a matter of faith that the future is going to be better. Um, I don't know why Kurzweil would assume that we will reach a technological utopia. There are just too many variables that are unknowns. And I think Bostrom's control problem is extremely serious. Uh, in other words, whether we will be able to control AI. Sorry, that's right. Yeah. Is Bostrom the one who also uh, made the argument that it's likely that we're living in a simulation? Yeah. Uh, uh, we, <laughs> I'm not teaching that. <laughs> Freaks the students out. Yeah. We may not yeah. have time for that one. And I'm not sure how that matches up with the AI <laughs> concern. I mean, uh, well, anyway. the So, so you, you've written a lot about, like, consciousness. Can computers have consciousness? Can AI be conscious? In your mind, is that... Is the answer to that question related to these other questions like like, uh, you know, would AI treat us well or not? And and, you know, would uh, anything we're contacted by from another planet be, in fact, a super intelligent version of AI? Are these are these questions interrelated or? Uh, That's a really good question. Um, so they are related and the issues are really subtle. Um, so. Some people worry that if AI could be conscious, it would somehow be more dangerous. Um, you know, I've been asked that question by people in the military, for example, um, who are developing um, robots for warfare. And I don't think that's the case. Um, it could actually lead to more compassion um, if something knows that it feels a certain way to be alive. Uh, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. I mean, if an AI isn't conscious, it may be programmed morally, and it may keep its moral programming and make itself even better. So I just think there are way too many variables for us to make any kind of clean claims about the relationship between consciousness and superintelligence. Mm -hmm. um, would a superintelligence be conscious? I mean, that's a really important question. I mean, it's also very important to figure out whether an AGI could be conscious. Which, is a, which is a general... Artificial general intelligence. And, and that and that means Robots what? that could... Well, I'll give you an example. Um, we don't have AGI yet. We're nowhere near it. Um, you know, it'll, it'll probably take about a decade. Um, well, it depends on how you define AGI, but anything sophisticated and human-like but I mean, consider the Japanese androids that um, are under development to take care of the elderly okay. in Japan. Now, if you have something in your house taking care of you, there are a million ways that it could mess up and inadvertently kill you or let the dog out or just do something really awful. So eventually, market forces will make that thing smart. Maybe not as smart as us, but intelligent enough to where we're asking questions about whether it can be conscious. Mm -hmm. And if it's conscious, then what right do we have to make it serve us? Um, that would be slavery, and we don't want to live like that again. So I think we have to think hard about what the nature of consciousness is, whether something that's made of a different substrate or made up in a different way, because there are silicon-based chips under development, I mean, uh, excuse me, carbon-based chips under development, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean they're going to be conscious like us right, just because right. we're carbon-based. It's the devil's in the in the details. So we have to actually investigate that very carefully and make sure that we're not exploiting um, things that maybe we would call people, even if they're not human. But how would you know? I mean, for all we know, computers are conscious now. I mean. I think my dogs have sentience. I think they have subjective experience, but they, they don't tell me they do, but I still think they do. And it's possible that that's true of all these information uh, processes that we already have that are artificial, right? It could be. I mean, there are some people who believe this. I'll, I'll spare you that, you know, there's this one theory called the information integration theory. Right. And, you know, sometimes philosophers who are pan psychists, which, mm -hmm. you know, Buddhists, can be very sympathetic to this view, think that experience is everywhere. So it's even there in the fundamental particles. Um, 
And so you might think, therefore, that things that are more complicated have a little more consciousness than something that's less complicated. So your laptop, you know, it has a bit of consciousness, but humans, wow, we are extremely complex and that's why we behave in a way that indicates that we have minds. I'm not sympathetic to that. Um, I, I, I don't think that that view is correct for technical reasons, I'll spare you. <laughs> But, um, I mean, it's definitely on the table. It's a really important position uh, right now in philosophy that a lot of people are talking about. So in your view, if AI was conscious, it would be because it had passed some threshold of complexity that it hasn't passed yet? Um, yeah, I mean, talk of thresholds is a little dangerous because it can imply that there's a firm line. Mm -hmm. and something on the other side of the line is not conscious and something on that the other side is and really it's going to be a matter of degree and that's probably how it is in nature in nature um, we can get a sense of consciousness because we can tell introspectively that we're conscious um, and then we look at other creatures based on neurophysiological similarity with us I mean you know, we're all in the same tree of life and dogs just aren't that unrelated to us. It will be really difficult with AIs, um, especially if their machine architecture is not reverse engineered from our own, the way our brain operates. So, you know, you might have a machine with a cognitive architecture in particular, that's like a human brain. And in that case, you might be able to say that it's likely that it's conscious, mm -hmm. you know, but that's an easy case. I don't think super intelligence is necessarily going to have an architecture that's similar to, mm -hmm. to ours. And even, and even if it said it was conscious, that might not be true. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, we see that in science fiction all the time, right? I mean, think of ex machina, um, and how, um, Ava convinced Caleb she was in love with him, right? I mean, an AI can be extraordinarily convincing. If they're super intelligent, they'll have greater social intelligence than we have. There'll be all sorts of ways that they could convince us of things if they wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one thing I thought was misleading about that movie, is a really good movie, Ex Machina, but was the idea that when AI first comes, it'll be like a robot. I mean, it seems to me like it's happening now it's like, you know, like I have just started actually asking questions of my phone. Like yesterday I said, okay, Google, when does the Republican National Convention start? And it told me. And that, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. That's, I mean, you yeah. know, it, it, did, it didn't just show me a website. It, the, she spoke the answer correctly. And, and, and when you think about that intelligence, that, of course, that is relatively crude, but it's going to get better and better. And when you think about what that intelligence is, it's highly distributed. When you look at all the signals that went into, you know, went out on the web and it got the answer. So it wasn't it wasn't like a physical being. And, and it just seems to me, I mean, a lot of people still talk as if we're talking about the development of a robot. But it seems to me we're all, already almost there. And that's why I think, you know, a big question is like, well, which company is going to really get there first? That's absolutely. You are absolutely right. Um, and, you know, when you think about Ray Kurzweil, who's a director of engineering at Google. Mm, ooh, spooky. <laughs> and they bought, uh, they purchased DeepMind. Yeah. It's, you know, the goal is to create intelligent machines and they're using uh you know, neural networks right, based right. on connectionism. Um, so yeah, I agree with you entirely. And now there's that open AI, uh, right. ironically started by Elon Musk, who was worried about super intelligence taking over the world. And so he created a platform to make public um, the development of AI. Well, I think the logic there uh, is something about how making it open, make sure that no one dominates the technology or something like that. Yeah. So, so there is an explicit uh, argument about how this averts it, that scenario. Yeah, it makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> I mean, making it available everywhere would seem to facilitate its development. Yeah, well, I mean, the other approach, if you're worried about dominance, would be old-fashioned antitrust. Like, make sure that no single company, at least make sure that we always have our choice of reasonably equal providers of, of AI, like like if Google gets too good, you make sure that like Apple or 
uh, or Facebook or various companies can kind of catch up. And so at least they would be competing with one another for our trust, you know, and because we'd have the option of switching AI providers. I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah, I like it. I haven't heard it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard it either. And we certainly need good suggestions about what to do. I mean, it looks like market forces are just going to go ahead and they seem to be leading to uh, yeah, it, yeah it's yeah. been called an ai arms race um yeah, yeah. and uh you know seems to me it's down to google and facebook just about uh with some several other possible contenders but um you know microsoft apple and uh, and amazon but anyway yeah yeah so on this consciousness question there's there's a lot of interesting uh questions this is related to and that you've written about and one is this question of whether uh in principle we could offload the contents of our brain to a silicon chip and thereby what create a version of ourselves or uh or in the case of you know given the fact that we're going to die maybe guarantee ourselves eternal life you know upload ourselves to the cloud yeah, Kurzweil scenarios. Yeah, and you're yeah. you're generally skeptical of these, I take it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a shame because it would be um, like an agnostic's guide to immortality, right? I mean, all these people have given up the idea of immortality, and science is uh, finding one. Perhaps mm. I would stick to cryogenics instead. <laughs> so that's where you're putting your money. That's what. You, so you've signed up. You've got the. You know, I did the other day. I talked to my husband about it to see if he would do it too. You yeah. know, um, I wouldn't rule that out. And I have friends who've done it. They wear tags around their really? necks. Really? Oh yeah. Are they going to have the whole body frozen or just the head? Well, that's a little personal. Yeah, but I, I don't know who these friends are. Well, you can save money if you just do your head. Well, you clearly. I mean, look, obviously, if you're charging the same amount for the head and the full body, we know what the choice is, right? I know. Totally. Well, it's it's cheaper. Yeah, for a head, it, it costs How less much cheaper it, is But it? then you could end up like that baseball player. What was his name? Ted Williams? Yeah, I think Ted Williams. They froze cheaper. his head. and I, The rumor is that it was thrown across the room. Someone was bragging they were drunk, and you didn't hear that. Someone wrote a book on it, got sued. You should definitely, if you're going to sign up for this, you should get a clause in the contract where they can't throw your head across a room. But you like not that. throw my head. So right. if you do the full body thing, it's harder to be catapulted across the room during a party. That's another reason to have your whole body frozen. I hadn't thought of that. Because then you need, like, you happen to have, you have to have, like, a championship shot putter at the party or it's not going to happen. And what are the chances of that? I know. I know. So, so... Uploading, okay, maybe uploading sounds better now that we just talked about. Yeah, I, I, I'm not big on the cryogenic, especially yeah. if it's head only. I'm totally not going to the head only thing. So talk to us about offloading as a possibly cheaper okay. alternative. Right. Um, yeah, so this really bugs me out because I just don't see how it would really be you. I mean, so if suppose it would be like Johnny Depp in Transcendence. Did you see that movie, Transcendence? No. He, he uploaded. No. Okay, well, you didn't miss much. But basically, um, he found out he was going to die and in a very short time. And so he uploaded himself. And then he became um, sort of like a crazy version of Ray Kurzweil. Okay, like an evil um, the, version. The implication of being that Ray Kurzweil is not already crazy. I actually really enjoy his work a lot. I'm kidding. He, he, look, he's he's he actually said... Bigger than I am. He's actually said nice things about a book of mine, so I'm totally on the Kurzweil bandwagon. Yeah, he's, I actually really enjoy his work and think he's, you know, a, a wonderful thinker. I just totally disagree with this uploading idea and think he's too utopian. But um, I, uh, uploading really bug, bothers me because suppose you do this, um, you pay all this money and your relatives, you know have to either come to grips with the idea or hopefully get enthusiastic and expect you back soon. So, you know, most uploading technology would be destructive. It would slice up your brain and measure the various interconnections between the neurons and then reconstruct uh, the neural information in the form of a program on a computer. Hmm. Okay. Now, how's that really survival of you? I mean, your brain has been... Uh, decimated and 
physical objects don't normally get transmitted, uh, you know, after being sliced up into a computer. It looks to me like what's going on is that a new a new creature's created. I mean, if a machine can be conscious, then maybe that thing really is conscious. But it looks to me like it's not really you. Right, so. but, but the philosophical premise of the argument that it is you, and this is really interesting to me, is that the essence of you is not in the physical stuff. The essence of you is in a pattern of information that is itself independent of physical substrate. Absolutely, and that is so confused, I think. So if on my website, um, I wrote a paper on this. It's called, I think it's called The Mind is Not the Software of the Brain or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because um, when I complained about uploading, I did it publicly. I did it very publicly in the New York Times. And so everybody wrote, a lot of people wrote responses. Um, so I felt like I had to write a response. And um, boy, like think about what a program is or a pattern of information. That's an abstract thing. So that's like um, saying that you are something like an equation. If you were a program, you would be lines of code. Lines of code are not really located anywhere. Um, they're abstract entities um, like equations. Like I can make an inscription right now on this pad of paper, but the equation itself isn't located anywhere. You're concrete. You can tell you're concrete because um, things happen to you. Like you can cause things. You're in space and time. You're not an abstract entity like a number. That would be something that's outside of space and time. I mean, debates about the nature of abstract entities occur in the field of philosophy of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of just the standard distinction between abstract and concrete entities. So I, I don't think that we are programs or that we're informational patterns. At best, we are instantiations of programs. Okay, but if I'm a program instantiation and you destroy the computer I'm on and upload that information, you create a different instantiation. And so you're not going to survive uploading. Well, if the premise, I mean, if if you accept the premise that what we are in essence is merely a pattern of information, then you will survive the uploading. Right. I mean. And it's hard to definitively disprove. And you know what's interesting about this to me, actually, is uh, on the one hand, whenever you hear these people say, well, you could just offload yourself to a silicon chip or upload yourself to the cloud and it would still be you. This sounds like a hardcore scientific materialist who would outrage uh, religious people and people in the humanities. And yet, in a way, what they're saying is... We are not merely material. Now, it's true that That's patterns right. of information always have a material instantiation. And in this scenario, you move them from one material instantiation to another. But at the same time, they're saying the essence of us is not material per se. A, and they're also opening up all these religious possibilities. You know, everlasting life, resurrection. Yes. It's fascinating, isn't it? I totally agree with you. I think that there are religious overtones to transhumanism. Um, sometimes people describe Kurzweil's view as a kind of new heaven picture. And, um, you know, our own Judeo-Christian background, I mean, I'm assuming you, you come from, you know, just roughly this neck of the mm -hmm. woods, could kind of implicitly motivate people, even if they're atheists or agnostics, to like this view. Um, but honestly, if you believe that the mind is just the brain, this picture is not friendly to uploading. Right. It's right. really not. Um, it really does treat us as if we are abstract entities, and that is very different than the standard materialist line that the mind is the brain. Mm -hmm. So let's let's play out some of these thought experiments uh, that lead you to be skeptical of the upload your brain scenario. So one thing you said was. Um, I don't know if this is a thought experiment, but you said, look, to be me is to be in physical space and to be able to kind of influence stuff. So if I'm just on a chip, that's different. Yeah. Now, that's true, but A, 
If I was suddenly paralyzed right now, could no longer influence anything, I'd still be me. I'd still have the history, and I'd still have that history of having been able to influence things. But but being able to continue to do that is not necessarily definitionally, you know, part of me. And B, you could always write, I mean, once you've got it on the chip, you could, in theory, build the robot that looks just like a person and can move and stuff. Isn't that... Yeah, you'd be creating a different instantiation of the same program or a program that's similar to that. But that wouldn't be you. So think of it like um, in the film I, Robot, when all those robots were rolling off the assembly line. Each one, if they were conscious at all, was a distinct consciousness. So if you create a duplicate, you're not creating you. You're just creating something that runs the same program. That's all you're doing, even if AI can be conscious. And that's an open question. That's something we may be mistakenly assuming. I, I see a lot of assumptions by transhumanists and technophiles that AI will mm -hmm. be conscious. Okay, oh. but let's take let's this scenario. I mean... Okay, so suppose on the one hand, I mean, suppose I'm going to be offloaded to, like, a computer that's, like, 10 yards over there. And, like, and then they're going to build a robot around me that looks just like me and acts just like me and can be motivated by that chip, right? You'll accept all those as part of the thought experiment? Totally. And, in fact, they could just download your program to hundreds of robots. Okay. So, but, but in that scenario... How is the experience of being the resurrected me different from the experience of, like, they just, like, I don't know, they drug me and move me over 10 yards and then wake me back up? I would have had exactly the series of experiences because certainly whatever is resurrected over there will have had the experiences I've had up Absolutely. till now. And, yeah. the, and, and, if we, and in that scenario where I, the actual me, is like, you know rendered unconscious, moved over and woken up, we would yeah. have exactly the same set of experiences. So it would certainly, you know, if we're assuming that, that consciousness would follow the instantiation of me to a silicon chip, uh, it would be, it would, being it would feel exactly like being yeah. me. It, it very well could. In fact, there's a great science fiction novel called Mind Scan by Robert Sawyer. Um, and I've, I've met him, actually. I, know, yes. I have, too. He's, he's terrific. Um, and, yeah, so I think that um, these kinds of scenarios are, in fact, depicted in science fiction. And, really, that creature would insist that it's you. Um, so we can't let the first-person experience guide our decision here because that could be mistaken. Um, so what you really have to think about is what constitutes survival over time for ordinary objects that helps um you know and ordinary objects don't just drop out of the space-time continuum and then appear somewhere else or get torn apart and sent into a computer reconstructed by um, a bunch of experts to lines of code i mean that's just not a normal route to survival so if i was going to bet on something i wouldn't bet that uploading worked mm -hmm. but that being said i should also warn you because i am a metaphysician and and i wouldn't be doing my, my job unless i told you that there's a big controversy in metaphysics about whether we do survive over time so you know if you think that we don't then you might want to upload because you might believe that you're creating a conscious being that is much like you and it can carry out your worldly tasks. Mm -hmm. And it would be, it wouldn't be literally you, but that would be the best you can do. And it's like your ordinary life anyway. So the controversy in metaphysics, you're saying there's controversy over whether what I think of as the continuous me that's here now and here and yeah. now is in fact the same me yeah. Or whether, yeah, that's actually pretty Buddhist. That, that kind of skepticism about Buddhist. continuity. And, I mean, you know, Nietzsche also held this. I mean, he wrote The I is a Grammatical Fiction. Um, and I think that on, hey, half the time, I'm serious, I really think this is the correct position. This position is held nowadays by Derek Parfit. Um, well, he's kind of Buddhist. 
Yeah, and and I honestly, mean, he's not literally, but his philosophy has been every right. time. I, every time I tell someone I'm writing a book on boot, well, not every time. People sometimes say we well, have to read Par, uh, Parfit's Reasons and Persons, or yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I think it's very difficult, <laughs> even for someone who you know is a trained metaphysician, to be certain or even you know say that something's more likely than the other when it comes to the personal identity question. Mm -hmm. So we have to be extraordinarily humble. So when I talk about uploading, the reason I do it is so that people will understand the implicit assumptions about identity that the proponents of uploading are making. Um, if the technology is developed, and I actually think this is also relevant just to brain enhancement questions, like um, should we be able to put chips in our brain and whatnot, one thing that people have to think about is whether they think it would still be them. Uh, so if you make a whole bunch of changes in a rapid fire way, and that creature turns out to be cognitively and perceptually very different than you, is it truly you? Because if you're enhancing, presumably, you know, the presumption here is that you're probably doing it to improve yourself, but you could be doing the exact opposite. You could be actually inadvertently ending your own existence. So people need to look at the metaphysics of personal identity, and that literature is really difficult um, for the ordinary person. And these are the people making, potentially making decisions about their future by um, using brain enhancements. Okay. okay. Yeah. The, the um... Now these are, uh, there's another set of philosophical questions. This is all kind of more obviously related to, which is your position on the mind-body problem, which in turn is related to, I guess, the question of continuity of identity, but it's not, yeah. the, it's not the same thing. Uh, do you, does your view on consciousness fall into any, fall under any well-known label, you know, dualism, epiphenomenalism, anything like that? Yeah, I'm writing a book on that now, so I'll try not to say too much because I know what happens when people ask you about the books that they're writing. Um, but um, yeah, so I I used to be a physicalist. I used to think that everything was physical or material. Um, which, which is now does that mean you were a behaviorist and you kind of thought that in no. a certain sense consciousness doesn't exist? No, not at all. No, um, I don't. I think. It, it would be really hard to deny that we're conscious. That's um, my view. <laughs> tell by introspecting. And I quite like the idea that consciousness is a fundamental feature of reality. So um, this view is held by people like um, David Chalmers, Galen Strawson, and even Jaguan Kim moved to that position uh, toward the end of his career. So I do like that view. Um, a lot of times people who hold that though also think that physical objects, well, excuse me, the mind is a physical thing. Um, well, the investigations I've been doing in the book lead me to reject physicalism altogether um, due to a new issue, due to the mathematical nature of physics and thinking the physical is platformed through. Uh, it led me to a frame a position where um, I'm a monist. I think that there's only you know one sort of kind of metaphysical uh, constituent. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, setting aside though, there is this outstanding issue of space time, which is a mess in physics right now that I'm really not going to. Yeah, let's leave space time aside. I'm, this is this is deep enough. Yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah. So. Basically, um, I am a monist, but I'm not a physicalist, but I'm also not uh, with the panpsychists. I don't think that there are many minds in particles and that they're having experience. Right. So pan panpsychists think that, that, that everything in the universe has some degree of consciousness associated with it. And then as things get assume more complex form in terms of information processing and stuff, they get kind of more richly conscious, right? But they think, yeah. yeah. So, so when you say you're not a you're not like a physicalist, uh, are you saying you do not think that consciousness is entirely dependent on the functioning of the brain? I mean, one view is so-called epiphenomenalism, which is that you know consciousness is has kind of the relationship to the brain that a shadow has to my hand. My hand's shadow has to my hand as my hand moves around. Right? It's 
It's it's the consciousness uh, is entirely uh, influenced by, shaped by, entirely dependent on the functioning of the brain, and then the consciousness does not in turn influence the brain. So that's is that in this. I don't have to worry about that, luckily, um, because for me, the fundamental ingredients of reality are um, proto-mental, and so the mental can, in fact, be causal. So it's like a panpsychist view, but I stay back. I don't, I don't say... So you're you're saying speak. mind is more fundamental than matter? No, they're equally fundamental, and in fact, one and the same thing in a sense, but I wouldn't use the word mind. I would say instead because I reject uh, panpsychism, that the properties out there um, are in fact proto-mental and you could say in a sense that they give rise to experience when they're in certain complex configurations that science details, like in the case of the brain, um, and they are the kind of things that physics talks about. Those are what philosophers call the truth makers for statements in fundamental physics. These are the fundamental properties of reality, but they have um, proto-mentality. That is, when, in their, when they are in certain configurations, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. as in the case of the brain, conscious experience happens. But those things are not correctly described as having experience or being minded. Um, or being selves, that's taking it too far. That's making a category mistake. Um, I mean, when we think of experience, it has, uh, you know, this important introspective aspect. Uh, we know it through first person introspection, through experience. And there's nothing like that at the level of a particle. It doesn't have the degree of complexity, but the building blocks are there. So it's a lot like panpsychism. Um, so wait, let me see if I understand. So you're saying all matter, it isn't like all matter is sentient as a panpsychist would hold, but all matter has a kind of latent capacity exactly. for sentience that uh, is becomes manifest if the matter is put into certain configurations. Perfect. That's exactly right. And, you know, what, what I really need to do, in fact, I have to write this chapter, is talk about the nature of properties, which is an issue in metaphysics, um, and say that properties have their dispositional natures essentially, which is a debate in metaphysics about what a feature or property is from a metaphysical standpoint. Um, so yeah, that's exactly the idea. Um, and earlier you asked me if I'm committed to the idea that consciousness is just a matter of the brain. And what I would say is that's an open empirical question. So that depends on uh, the issue of whether I could add a chip to my brain and it could actually enable consciousness. So uh, I gave a TED talk a couple, like about a month ago, and I suggested a chip test for determining if AI could be conscious. So suppose I find out that um, I'm going to die, I have a brain tumor, and it's in an area of the brain that's responsible for visual consciousness. So they put silicon-based chips in. If I don't lose my visual consciousness, and if the chip designers don't fiddle with things to fool me, um, we can tell that a silicon-based creature has the potential to be conscious. So that's an empirical question. It's something for further research, very okay, careful. So in this scenario, wait, the silicon chip is, is replacing what part of your brain? Not just your eyeballs, but more than that. But yeah, part of your brain responsible for visual consciousness. Mm -hmm. So suppose, you know, part of my visual field, I lose it because of this brain tumor. And, you know, suppose that they know that the area that directly influenced mm -hmm. consciousness is affected. If they put chips in and... I, my consciousness is restored, um, mm -hmm. and there aren't any fun and games in the lab trying to make me falsely claim that I'm conscious. I mean, you know, philosophers will find out right. different thought experiments. In fact, there's a debate about this between myself and Eric Schwitzgable um, at uh, his blog, Splintered, The Splintered Mind. It's a really interesting uh, debate. But um, I do, the upshot is, um, consciousness could go beyond my brain. My consciousness could be extended um, if the chip test succeeds. So I'm very open to the extended consciousness approach where by that I mean that consciousness could 
go beyond the brain if these tests work. But you don't accept, uh, you wouldn't accept a test that was where, where the uh, artificial component was more at the sensory level, like a cochlear implant or, or even a hearing aid, right? I, I mean, and it seems to me the question becomes, well, how deep does it have to go? I mean, where do you draw the line between it's, sensory assistance, right? And at what point does it become a valid yeah. test in your view? I mean, this is a, there's a big debate right now about what parts of the brain are responsible for consciousness. It could be that it is determined by the complex interaction between various parts of the brain. I happen to think that. Um, so I'm interested in what's called the global workspace view, which connects consciousness up to working memory and attention. I mean, you have to, if you were to do a chip test, you would have to have a correct theory of the neural basis of consciousness in hand. And also, you know, you'd have to make sure that you weren't just fixing something downstream from consciousness. And that's why consciousness went back online. Um, but I do think that that is something that we could figure out in principle. Um, and that would give us some indication as to whether a machine has the capacity to be conscious and whether we could enhance our brain. I but see, that I doesn't see. mean we could upload. Uploading just seems like a very bizarre suggestion for survival where a brain is taken apart, reconstructed. I mean, at least... Yeah, but you can't, know, can't you imagine uh, systems just, of detecting all the information in my brain that aren't so intrusive? I mean, someday, couldn't we have like a brain scan that does this? That that detects consciousness. I mean, yeah, that 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 maps all of the information in my brain for purposes of uploading without cutting my brain up, which seems to yes. trouble you for yeah. understandable reasons. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, people who talk about uploading distinguish between um, a kind of destructive uploading, which is what I was talking about, which they say would happen in the early development of uploading, and a non-destructive form, which is, as you say, where you kind of step into the scanner. Now, but think about that. So if you survive and there's another creature there that is, you know, downloaded from that computer standing next to you, where would you place your bets on which one was you? I mean... <laughs> well, it could be that's just a problem of human language. But the idea that there is one me, but... Uh... I mean, I, I guess I would say that at the moment of the person's creation, at that moment, there are just kind of two me that we have equally legitimate claims. But thereafter, since our experiences will differ by virtue of our different location in physical space, immediately we become two different people because we have a different experiential history and behave differently as a result. Yeah, yeah, I... I, I I understand your position. Um, it's I not actually even a position. I'm just throwing things out. No, but I mean, you know, hey, that may be how things are one day legally for people mm -hmm. who upload. And I agree with you that um, they definitely are two different people once the experiences happen that are different. Mm -hmm. We just disagree on whether it's possible that um, they were at one time. Well, I guess what I'm saying, it, it, it's... I'm not sure it's that so much as I'm wondering whether in assessing the actual possibility of doing the thing and creating this conscious being, whether this semantic question of who that person would be uh, is really should really influence our estimate of the plausibility of the of the actual operation of creating another conscious being that at least at its inception is identical to me. I mean, right. I mean. I don't know. I, 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 that's the question I'm raising. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, think of it like this. It's about life and death. I mean, if you believe in survival. On the other hand, if you're a Buddhist, it's a totally different ballgame. It's not a question about survival because there is no self and right. there's nothing to survive. Right. Con it's, the continuity of identity was a, was a, a misperception okay. to begin with. Right. So if you're a Buddhist, um, you know, really the issue is creating a life form that has the highest potential um, for conscious experience and to benefit uh, humanity and maybe the other AIs, <laughs> right? 
Um, but if you do believe in survival, I would be more careful than just calling personal identity a linguistic issue. I mean, think about it like, I mean, is there a fact of a matter if someone showed you um, a picture of your kindergarten class, which child was you? And how would you feel if you were told that, you know, some child who, you know, looks like that child your parents tell you was you, um, was going to some time travel who's going to kill it. How would you feel? Would you be like, uh oh, I won't be here? If so, it's because you're implicitly assuming that there really is an issue here that goes well beyond just linguistics. Yeah. Um, there's a metaphysical question of what really survives, and it's life or death. It is, although our whole concern with survival, I would say, was built into us by natural selection because that's the way to preserve the genes that natural selection favors. And I wouldn't assume that the ideas and drives and interests it builds into us to preserve the genes actually correspond to deep philosophical truth. They're just convenient from natural selection's point of view. They're just things that help get genes into the next generation. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, I'm just grateful to be on the planet and enjoy everything that, you know, natural selection has given us. And I don't feel like being killed. Um, right. But I, we agree on, we agree on this. Yeah. And you know, there could be a really deep issue here. We're just not getting yet. I mean, we have no sense of the final theory of consciousness, what it's going to look like. Personal identity could be primitive, metaphysically speaking. There could be something that we just don't even understand. Um, I don't think physicalism uh, is correct, so I think our current paradigm about uh, survival over time, the nature of the mind is probably false. And everything's up in the air right now in physics. I mean, they're now saying space-time may be emergent. Um, it's not even fundamental. So we, do, we do they, have they explained what is fundamental if it's not space-time? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's my big objection. I don't. They can't get rid of time. They need an ordering of events to get anything to happen. And that's a kind of time, even if it's not space time. So, I, you know, but I mean, you know, maybe energy. Um, but it, it is fascinating. And it gets you to these ideas where, you know, almost sounds as if mathematics itself is fundamental, as if the equations are concrete. It's um, like Pythagoreanism, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, minus the mysticism, or maybe with it. Uh, but there's a lot going on we don't know about, and so I'm not going to make a judgment based on uh, a little bit of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't know. We don't know why we're here. We don't know what's metaphysically fundamental. Yeah. The um, Don't you sometimes think, I mean, you said we don't understand consciousness yet. Don't you think it's possible that we just can't and never will because like, because of, I mean, because we are conscious beings. I, I mean, we're very good at understanding the world out there kind of, and, and even the physical world in here. But, but I mean, don't you think it's possible? I mean, because one thing about subjective experience is it's not amenable to the same kind of scientific analysis that the physical world, what we think of as the physical world is, right? I, I mean, in other words, what I'm feeling right now, per se, the truly subjective part of my experience, not the physical manifestation or reflection but the, or, or, or basis, but the subjective experience is not publicly observable. I'm the only one who can observe it. I mean, sure, it may have manifestations and brain scans, but the actual experience can only be observed by me, and that means it's not amenable to scientific study in the sense that everything else is, right? It's distinctive. Um, you know, one of my books, it's actually called The Blackwell Companion to Consciousness, and it's coming out in second edition, pardon okay. me, with Max Velmans. Um, and, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about um, first-person experience and how it relates to the scientific study of the brain. And consciousness studies, that field, is in fact distinctive for that reason, mm -hmm. as you say. And it's very exciting um, because there's nothing like conscious experience. And I think you're right to ask whether we will ever understand it. Um, there is this idea of cognitive closure that um, Colin McGinn is responsible for, or mysterianism. And it may in fact be the case that um, we don't have the right cognitive equipment to figure out the answer to the mind-body problem as well as 
a variety of other problems that drive us crazy, like the problem of free will. Who knows, maybe um, when we enhance our brains using um, you know, additional intellectual resources, we will all of a sudden think through very different philosophical answers to the age-old questions. And it may be that there are other species out there on other planets that have better answers for similar questions or even ask different questions. I think humility is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or maybe when we have this uh, silicon enhancement, we'll use it to conquer other planets and just kill all the philosophers because they're they get in the way of doing that. Oh, that sounds like a science fiction novel. Let's hope not. Okay, yeah, I doubt it. Uh, final question <laughs> is: uh, Doesn't this sometimes just kind of freak you out? I mean, the problem sometimes the problem of when I'm thinking about consciousness, it just it, it almost starts feeling like a little. Uh, I don't want to say spooky, but it's just like I can't figure it out, and it's so yeah. weird that I almost don't want to think about it. Yeah, isn't it funny? I mean, I guess I'm really quirky. Um, I mean, uncertainty does not trouble me, um, but I don't think about it 24-7. You know, I take breaks and mm -hmm. <laughs> have a life, um, you know, but no, it doesn't bother me. I think it's just fun to be on the planet into uh, reflect on these issues and make a little progress mm -hmm. um, and hopefully help students along and it would be really great if humans did have the right cognitive equipment uh, to think through the problem so on a good day I think about um, the discoveries in physics I mean aside from my complaints about what's going on at the level of string theory I mean, quantum mechanics is really hard for us to wrap our minds around but we were still able to discover it and it's incredibly accurate predictively so let's hope that even if the right philosophical theory um, you know is difficult for us to understand we'll figure out a way to wrap our minds around it so I try to be optimistic okay well we have not uh, so exhausted the subject that we couldn't have another conversation down the road but this is probably enough for people to digest right now uh so thanks where can people find your your work are there any any anything you want to plug uh twitter feeds or websites i mean you just mentioned the uh blackwell companion to consciousness which is uh relevant to all this oh yeah my research assistant janelle um just put together a lovely new website for me so i'll thank her and uh, tell you to hit schneiderwebsite.com there's all kinds of free loot on there um mm -hmm. Podcast, TED Talks, book introductions. I write op-eds, so you can check out uh, my blog at the Huffington Post. Um, you know, hopefully this discussion will have served you well. It thank has, you it has so far. Well, thanks a lot, Susan. Well, thank you. It was really nice talking to you. Same here. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.